Hello to the Ontario Association of Medical Radiation Sciences. My name is Andy Thibodeau. What a blessing. What a blessing I had to be one of your speakers at your Synergy Through Connection conference held on May 2nd of 2020. And greetings to thousands of healthcare workers who will take in this program in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you for having me be part of this wonderful event. And I needed to deliver this video pre-recorded as I did my introduction live back on the 2nd. You know, I'm coming to you from London, Ontario, Canada. Do you know that for the 194th year in a row, London, Ontario, Canada was voted the second best London in the entire world? Sorry. And here in my hometown, where I was born at uh, St. Joseph's Hospital, now part of the London Health Sciences Centre, along with uh, University Hospital and Victoria Hospital. And in fact, um, when they closed the maternity ward at St. Joe's Hospital a few years ago, they listed all the famous people born there. I did not make the list. But I was born in the same hospital, some very famous Canadians, including... Justin Bieber, Rachel McAdams, she had her breakout role in a movie called Mean Girls and people loved her in The Wedding Crasher and Notebook and Doctor Strange and I was born in uh, the same hospital as Ryan Gosling, you know, he was up for an Oscar for a movie called La La Land and, and of course uh, also well known in movies like Blade Runner and The Notebook and a lot of people think I, I look like Ryan. And I'm coming to you from my hometown as I celebrate the work of the Ontario Association of Medical Radiation Sciences and healthcare professionals across the continent while in the middle of a global pandemic that has totally changed everything about our lives. And when I was asked to speak under these circumstances, a line from a comedy movie, actually, really struck me about your work and what we're doing in these times. The movie was 2003's Bruce Almighty. And in that movie, where Jim Carrey plays Bruce and the great Morgan Freeman plays God, there's a scene after they'd done a thorough cleaning of an all-white room and they're reflecting on the challenges of life. God offers some simple advice to Bruce. Don't wait for the miracle. Be the miracle. That line has always struck me. You know, that summer of 2003, I visited a child that my wife and I sponsor in Kenya to see firsthand the impact of $30 a month. Don't wait for the miracle. Be the miracle. Think about this conference. So when I got the phone call or the email in mid-March saying it had been canceled, like all gatherings, it was par for the course with all the cancellations happening in my life you see, I'm a professional speaker, and since 1992, 28 years, my full-time living has been traveling Canada and the United States, where I've had my U.S. work visa since the 90s, visiting schools, uh, conferences, uh, special events. While my specialty is grades 1 through university college students, I also work with a lot of adults who are both uh, educators and people like yourself looking for a high energy and unique start to any sort of event. But what I appreciate about this conference is after two weeks, Shannon McCracken from your head office, along with John and, and Greg and your entire board, they kind of created a miracle. They decided, wait, we're going to go ahead with this. We're not going to let... Well, <laughs> an incredibly unique event stop us. 
and they move the entire conference online, arranging the technology, arranging the logistics, arranging the speakers. Remember, Shannon initially told me she was hoping for 150 participants, but by the time we were online, Saturday, May 2nd, 2020, over 700 professionals were online with us and news that we'd be sharing this message with thousands and thousands of other healthcare professionals across North America. This is what happens when people like you take action and create miracles. So when I knew that your theme was synergy through connection and collaboration, I thought of that line. And that is why I hope you enjoy my program called Synergy Through Connection and Collaboration Creates Miracles. Hi, welcome to my studio, or as we call it at the Thibodeau household, our basement, where the uh, iPhone is situated on an old uh, dresser and the kids Lego and our ping pong tables to the left and an old couch to the right where the back of the couch has been severely chewed by our house rabbits. A lot of change. This has been a time of a lot of change and I thought I experienced change in November of 2018 as I tell you a little bit about my family and how it connects to multiple aspects of my story over the next few minutes. We had a new member of our church, uh, a new member join our church back about five, six years ago named Jules Mabondo. And as we learned his amazing story um, that he had seven children and his wife still remaining in Congo, we uh, became very empathetic to his situation and his long wait to be reunited with them. And I uh, was blessed to be on the front lines of that reunite, reuniting in the uh, fall of 2018 when the seven kids and the wife finally arrived in Canada. But he was in a two bedroom apartment and housing was an issue. So my wife and I offered our house to what they decided would be best for their family. And that ended up being that the three oldest, Didine, Rochelle, and Baini, would join our family. And here's a great picture of us uh, here. I always say to people, this is now my family, and that in the 10 months, I didn't go from losing a bedroom, but I gained additional daughters. So in the picture you see in, at the right, uh, Rochelle, now 20, my daughter Tori, 14, my daughter Isla, 11, my wife, we've been together now 25 years, uh, married 22, and uh, Bainey, 21, and Dedean on the far left there at age 18. And that is my family. And I'm blessed to call them my nieces, as they call me, Uncle Andrew. So how did you get started in speaking is a very common question I get asked. And it started in the spring of 1988. 1988, I was in grade 12 at Laurier Secondary School in London. And back in those days, we had grade 13 in London, in Ontario. And I ran for student council president of Laurier Secondary School. I won the election because nobody ran against me. It was a hard campaign. And I had this great idea. Why wait till September to get our incoming grade nines pumped up about our school? Why don't we go visit them in June of grade eight? As I referenced already, don't wait for the miracle. Be the miracle. Create the miracle. And my idea in that spring of 1988 is why wait to the fall when we can greet and get our grade nines excited about the school in June of grade eight, visit them where they're already comfortable, start promoting activities and involvement. It was the first time I had to sit down and kind of come up with a 
motivational program. And it was basically based on what I know now as a, as a grade 12 that I wish I knew as a grade 8. We had a fantastic year school spirit. And in fact, Much Music named us the most spirited school in all of Canada in 1989. So in that spring of 1989, I'm about to graduate grade 13, off to King's College, Western University, to become a high school history geography teacher. I was asked to return to those elementary schools and revisit the grade eights. I agreed, this time bringing the new student president. I would do my part called share your care, take advantage of your time in school, while the new student council president would introduce themselves and we then start a new tradition. And throughout my time in university, I would do these uh, two days, visit four or five of the feeder elementary schools, and that's how I got started. My big break came in December of 1991 when a good buddy, buddy of mine who I grew up with in high school and elementary school named Stu Saunders was invited to speak at a leadership conference for all the London area schools. He had volunteered because they were complaining that their activities were not getting the participation they wanted. He suggested a conference. They said they had no money for speakers. He volunteered himself and eventually me to do it for free. Don't wait for the miracle. Create miracles. A key part of my story was Stu volunteering us for no pay for what would be become our first of thousands of speeches. So December 13th, 1991, in front of 10 schools and uh, 80 delegates at Central Secondary School, we gave our first ever presentation based on how to run a more successful student council. I thought I would never do anything like it again. I was in a third year university on one of my way to become a high school history and geography teacher. But afterwards, three schools came up to us. Wow, you guys are great. How much do you cost to speak at our school? I had to look at Stu and say, Stu, how much do we cost, man? Do you know how they paid me for my first speech? A 20 pack of Timbits. And three of them were plain. They didn't even count. So 17 Timbits, and I had to share that with Stu, eight and a half Timbits is how I first got paid in December of 1991. We gave our first paid engagement in February of 92 at Oak Ridge Secondary School here in London, and I'm blessed to say it's been my full-time career since that fall. I traveled as half of Andy and Stu's speakers from 92 to 99, and from 99 on, I've been on my own, doing my own thing as I travel North America. Stu and I remain good friends, and in fact, I'm doing an online leadership conference with him and 30 other speakers uh, a few days after you see this video. So I'll never forget the week before March break of this year. It was a typical school trip. I was visiting six schools in New Brunswick. And on March 12th, I just had a fantastic day at JMA Armstrong uh, High School, and that's located in Salisbury, New Brunswick, and Petticodiac Regional High School there in Petticodiac, home of the Panthers, home of the Cougars. And I just picked up some pizza, and I was eating it in the car on my way to this beautiful bed and breakfast located in Cambridge Narrows, New Brunswick, when I get the phone call from my wife saying, all the Ontario schools are going to be closing for two weeks after March break. My heart sank as what was coming together in those weeks was truly hitting us all. By the time I got into the bed and breakfast and met my hosts, Innes and Doug, uh, Innes being a retired teacher, I got up to my room and the emails were already coming in. Cancellation upon cancellation of bookings. Thunder Bay, a week in Saskatchewan, a couple days in British Columbia, a trip to Pennsylvania. Cancellation, cancellation. I, it was like a punch to the gut. Mix that in with, with, with fear, with some anxiety about 
health, about the world, about my career, about where the next paycheck comes from. Uh, my wife is a high school French supply teacher. How does all of this? And I, uh, I come downstairs after about an hour and I say to Innes, I think my life just dramatically changed. She said, how so? And I started to explain to her. So if we want to create miracles, one thing I've consistently found in creating synergy through collaboration is you need to have the courage to share. Share your goals, share your fears, share your beliefs, share your opinions, share what's going on and with honesty. And I'm just so glad I right away got it off my chest and just started telling her how I felt. And I still remember her response. Can I make you a cup of tea? That would be nice. I'm not much of a tea drinker, but yes, that would be nice. And by a cast iron stove with home knit socks that she had provided, we had tea and snacks as we got to know each other. And for about an hour, I could put behind what was happening. So Friday, yeah, Friday the 13th ended up being my last day of school visits, visiting Cambridge Narrows School in the morning, a K-12 building, and Belle Isle Regional High School in the afternoon, a grade 6 to 12 building. The students were amazing. The staff were amazing. I actually did an after-school staff program for Belle Isle, and Kim, who arranged my presentation, said, I'm wondering if this is going to be our last presentation for a very long time. And it ended up being that. You know, I, uh, I taught the kids a, uh, a fun activity called Dexterity Check. You're going to see it right here. Check Dexterity. Who are you? Yeah. Who are you? Yeah. Who's number one? Yeah. Give yourself a round of applause. So those four days, immediately after that last speech, March 14th of 17th, as additional cancellations and bad news hit both myself personally and bluntly the world, I was finding myself frustrated. I was finding myself unsure of my ability. I was finding myself short with my wife and two kids. And bluntly on the Tuesday, we had to have a bit of a family talk. Some tears were shared from all of us as all of us shared what we were going through. My kids missing their friends and wondering about school and Nana Papa and Grandma and of course my wife and her parents both dealing with some minor health issues and right away quarantining themselves. And it's good to share. It's good to ask questions. The power of interest. Be interested, not just interesting. Be interested, not just interesting. And I remember that family meeting just beginning to help reassure myself and not that I, we had all the answers but just reassure and I know you do that as you collaborate synergistically by asking each other questions not only about the job you're doing but also what's going on in your life. I also knew that a big part of what would make me feel better is people, right? And here I was, I'm a people person and I'm talking to a camera right now. I don't know what's funny. I don't know what's getting a reaction. And, and that was already starting to happen by Tuesday where I can't visit my friends. I can't see my wonderful nieces who are now living with another friend, Beth. See, they moved out into a situation that was a little bigger for them. They now each have their own bedroom and they have their own kitchen in a situation that Beth was able to provide them as a, um, as a uh, empty nester. So 
I decided on that Tuesday, I'm gonna go visit the girls and see Dedeen and Bainey and Rochelle because they always make me laugh and, and I miss them. So I make my way and we have a physical distancing few laughs as they were in the, uh, <laughs> in the, the doorway and I was on the lawn and Beth came home with her eldest daughter. And I right away asked, hey, Elspeth, you know, how is this affecting you? And she explained how it was affecting her place of work, in particular her restaurant. And of course it was closed and she wasn't working. And so as Beth walked by and I said, Hun, how's Ariel doing? Oh, she's so busy. Oh yeah, yeah, she's at Loblaws. Oh yeah, it's just crazy, crazy at Loblaws right now, she said. Well, how are you doing, she said. That's the key. When people ask you questions, what a compliment it is to then ask the person who's asked that question how they're doing, what they're going through. And as I now evaluate the past month and have my life, another key step was Beth sending it back to me. How are you doing, Andrew? Not good, Beth. I've lost 31 bookings and my income went from here to zero. And I know the government's promising, but I have no idea what I'll qualify for. It was so early, right? I know we know more now, but it was so early and it was so scary. And I shared that. And Beth just looked at me and said, you should apply to Law Bloss. They're busy. I know they're hiring. I, I never thought of that. You know, sometimes we get doing something, in my case, 28 years as a self-employed motivational speaker. You should apply to Law Bloss. So as I got in my car and headed home, I was thinking about that. What is going to stay open? Where can I be on the front lines where me as a people person who's going to find being cooped up at home is just not going to work for me? Already four days of it was not working for me. Loblaws. I thought of another company as well. And the next day on the Wednesday, I called my brother to check in with him. He said, oh, bro, I just got back from Costco. Oh, it's impressive what they're doing to separate everybody and maintain physical distancing as they wait in line. There it is. Costco as well. But again, ties into what I mentioned early. Reach out. Share how you feel. People will give you a perspective that you never have thought of. And when my brother said Costco, I added that, and that was the third company I was going to apply for on that Wednesday of March break, five days after my last professional speech as a motivational speaker. By the way, do you know what you need for a job application? A resume. And I've never done a resume. Even as a teenager, I, I worked for my uncles two summers. I cut grass. I, I worked for the Board of Education through a great reference through my principal. I never created a resume. And I had to look at my wife and say, can you help me build my resume? Tell people where you think you need help. My wife often for, well, for two semesters, had taught uh, a business computing in French, and they did a, par, a, par, a, a unit on resume building. So I submit her the information. She did a fantastic job. I still remember the first draft I sent her thinking, is this good enough? And she bluntly said, ah, no, <laughs> this isn't good enough at all. And on that Wednesday night, I submitted my resume to three companies. Thursday, 11 a.m. Never forget, I got in from a walk with my family in a forest, and the phone rings, and it says Costco Wholesale. What? I just supplied last night. And Brandy's on the phone. Oh, can you come in at 1 o'clock? 
Yes, I can. You have nothing going on? I have nothing going on. I have no plans. I am looking at my calendar and I've done something I've never done. I have erased every booking for three months using my iPhone delete button. I got no plans. I can be there at one. But I was there at 1230. If you want miracles to happen, you got to create them. And my timing could not have been better. It's just something I've always done as a speaker. I always get somewhere a half an hour early. At least I prefer 40 minutes. Right? I, I make sure the microphone's working. I make sure the, uh, the lighting is good. I meet the principal. I meet administrators. I meet the advisor. I meet a few student leaders. I ask about upcoming events. And I drop those interactions into my speech. I cater my speech very specifically to what's going on in the school. It's bluntly why they hired me for this uh, opportunity at your conference today. You know, they wanted me to be the opening speaker to get you all laughing and interacting to meet with their, to match their, uh, their idea of synergy through collaboration and connection. And I was going to be the one connecting everybody. And now I'm here on the other side of this iPhone. But how can I take what I'm already good at and enjoy doing and bring it to a new lifestyle? I arrived a half an hour early because I know that would make me feel better. That gets me in the zone. This is my first job interview ever. And I'm 50 years old and walking into a retail situation that I have no history with. I've never touched a cash register. And I was nervous. So I walk in, and my timing could not have been more perfect. Brent McCallum. You see, at Costco London North store, there's a, a hierarchy, and there's a general manager, and then there's five managers. And two of those five I went to high school with. And perfectly timing. Brent is working the door. Hey, Thibodeau! Hey, Brent! Oh, man, he comes over, and right away we do the high elbow. So sorry again to hear about Matt. Yeah, we lost a good old friend of ours to the heart attack last November. Um, and as we chatted about that loss, we began our walk. He then showed that interest that has made him such a successful manager at Costco for, uh, oof, it'll be 28 years he's been with Costco. So Andrew, are you here? I'm applying for a job, Brent, and gave him the two, three, four minute version of what had just happened in my life in the past five days. Oh, wow, yeah, because I know you're a speaker, and yeah, I can see how this would totally affect you. Well, listen, I'll go get brandy for you. Brent, no, I mean, my, my appointment's at 1. It's like 2, 12.45. He just stops and looks at me. I'll get Brandy for you. Okay. So he uh, comes out and introduces me to Brandy, uh, my human resources manager. Brandy, this is Andrew, Andrew Brandy. Um, Brandy, list me as a reference. List uh, Fraser McDonald, another friend of mine who works there, as a reference. Uh, and let's make this quick. Andrew, welcome to the Costco team. I almost cried. <laughs> you gotta picture how busy Costco was, and there's lineups, and there's energy, and there's all these faces I don't know, and then I see a familiar face, though somebody I haven't seen in a while, but a familiar face from my teenage years, and He's encouraging. See, we're going to have synergy. You need to have the courage to share, that power of interest, and then that benefit of encouragement. And his kind words and encouragement right in front of Brandy, you know, use me as a reference. I needed that. I needed that in my life.
life at that time. You have that opportunity every day with your coworkers, the people you love. That little push, that, that encouragement, that smile. And if you can't show that smile behind the mask, the thumbs up and the compliment that you can verbalize. So 10 days after my last speech, my new career at Costco began. Now in my live programs, every 20, 25 minutes, I do something with my audience to get people to stand up, stretch, interact, and um, re-energize. Let's still do that. So please, wherever you are, stand up and join me for a second. This is a simple one that I think translates best in this situation. I have dozens, but we'll just do this simple one. Reach up, reach up, reach for goals, reach for dreams, reach for our potential, reach out. Reach down, reach down to help others, reach down to help those who need a lift up. Connect with somebody to your left. No, your right, it'd be your right. Connect with somebody to your left. Up for goals and dreams down to lift other people up right left follow my speed up down right left up down right left up down right left give yourself a high five give yourself two high fives give yourself three high fives i suddenly feel like i'm in a virtual sea world here Thank you so much. Now let's revisit my story as I take apart and analyze the connection of, um, of my message of synergy through connection and how my story and my experiences at Costco tie into another family story that ends with a miracle. Thanks again. Synergy through collaboration creates miracles. My mind, my experiences, especially over the last five weeks, proven to me that collaboration involves three things. The courage to share, the power of interest, and the value of encouragement, especially in this time of unprecedented change. And whether it's Costco, or in the healthcare field, we both are facing massive changes. Just to give you an example, so I was speaking with Jay, he's one of the uh, managers of the Costco I work at in North End London, and he said Costco has implemented over 220 protocol changes in the last five weeks. And oh, by the way, on top of all those changes, what else have we added? We have added things like employees dealing with their own health issues, their own fears, their own challenges with possible uh, being compromised health-wise, their own um, families and supporting those families, whether it's elderly parents or health compromised, extended family and friends. Um, a number of them were coming back from trips overseas, especially to the States, and having to do the uh, two-week uh, quarantine. Um, at the same time, they were doing a hire, like people like myself, combined with their student hires, and training them and partnering up rookies like me with veterans like a Petrina or a Leslie, or even those with two or three years experience, like a, a Tori or a Tate. And all of that, 220 changes. Uh, just a few, for example. Um, typically a Costco store on a typical busy day has between 850 and 950 people in the store. The veteran's telling me that they can sometimes welcome 350 to 400 new mem members every half hour. Now, 
we've moved our line outside. Now we have clickers counting people in and on the way out, and we maximize the number of people in the store somewhere between 180, 220, a massive change. So even though our members are now lining up outside and they're thinking this is going to take a while to get inside and they've seen now more room than they've ever seen, let alone our world famous uh, food samples aren't there, freeing up even more room in the aisles. Um, every other cash register is now open in order to maintain the physical distancing but also changing outright how many people we can move through the cashier. And in fact, a normal cashier setup used to be two people, now we have three. Somebody that unloads the buggy, the cashier, and somebody that reloads that uh, buggy. Um, we have yellow marks now all over the floors and around the cash area showing people where to stand and where to put their carts. Um, our famous red vests are now really on, only wore by the supervisors and the people on the way out. Why? One less thing to touch, one less thing to wash, one less thing that in our early days might carry the virus. And um, finally, you know, every shift now starts with uh, the medical questionnaire. Um, initially, masks were an option. They've not been an option for the past two weeks. And even something as simple as now all of our name tags as of three weeks ago add this great little logo, Costco Cares. Please stand two meters away. So I can so relate to our challenges of creating synergy through collaboration while dealing with tremendous change, not only in our workplace, but in our home life. So now I want to revisit some of my story and touch on each element of collaboration. The element of the courage to share, the power of interest, and the value of encouragement. The courage to share. One of the biggest challenges to having the courage to share is that we so often think that admitting that we have questions, that we are challenged, that we feel weak, that this is difficult, we think people will think less of us and thus we're hesitant to ask for help. And I know that some of the biggest mistakes I've made in my life are because I didn't ask for help. I kept it to myself. I thought I can handle this. And, it, and it's amazing, for example, in my speaking career, my main story is not about winning a gold medal, defeating cancer, winning the Stanley Cup. I have a very normal story. If anything, it's a story about failure and admitting weakness. I talk about trying out for football in grade nine. You see, my favorite sport in elementary school was football. And as you can tell in high school, I played football. But seriously, I was this tall at age 12. Six foot with a size 11 shoe. Get a load the size of my legs, they called me Cheetah Boy, running all over the place. So when I played football in grade seven and eight with friends, I was pretty good. I was tall, I could block passes and catch passes. So then along comes high school, and what did I want to get involved with? Well, one of the things was football. One of the challenges, though, I was six foot. 118 pounds. My number one enemy in grade nine, the wind. Now, as you can tell, I've really filled out since then. I'm now six foot, 144 pounds, which means I'm 16 pounds underweight for a six foot woman. So you might not be surprised, but I was. When I try out for football, on the first day of school, Laurier Secondary School, fall of 1984, I got cut. And it was such a challenge, right? Lining up against big offensive linemen like Harry McDonald looking at me, I'm gonna hurt you. And I'm looking at him thinking, I know. But when I talk in my assembly about 
the pain of getting cut on my first day of high school and how that affected me two weeks later where I didn't go to a student council meeting because I just experienced failure and my friends didn't want to go. And a year later, I didn't try out for football again. I don't get looks of uh, insult. I don't get people falling asleep. I don't get young people not shaking their heads. I get nods. People can relate to failure. They appreciate your honesty. And don't get me wrong, we've all had experiences where we've been honest and it's been thrown in our face. And I get that. But what I have found in a very general sense, that having that courage to share encourages other people to share. Think about my story, right? The courage to share with my family and get some encouragement from them. Hey, this is tough on your dad. This is tough on your husband. This is really tough, I was saying to them. And I, I'm sorry for me being short with you. Uh, the courage to share with Beth and my nieces, and thus her suggestion about applying to retail space, something I hadn't even thought of, and how that carried over into a conversation with my brother, who then got me thinking about Costco. And even now in the workplace, you know, I am now standing beside people, in some cases 30 years younger than me, and saying, so how do you do this again when the meat is over $100 and there's no barcode. What do you, oh, okay, so all meat at Costco that's over $100, and we do sell some of it. These are great cuts of meat. There's no barcode, so you have to enter in the number by hand, including the price. And what seemed like so much to memorize five weeks ago, it's now coming to me because I've had the courage to look at people sometimes way younger than me and say, I forgot, what's the bar, the code again for bananas? Because I've learned, you might as well just enter it in because bananas come in bags and it's really hard to open up that skew and make it scan. Ugh, 30669, enter. And by the way, bananas at Costco, $1.59 every time. The courage to share. The power of interest. Asking questions and genuinely listening to the answers. Be interested, not just interesting. Because being interested makes you interesting. One thing that has so impressed me in this time of unprecedented change at the world's second largest retailer is that the managers and supervisors are asking questions of our team. How can we make this better? We've done this. How can we make this better? And just a few of the changes that I know have been implemented because of employee suggestions. So uh, take, for example, um, the, uh, our eating area. So here we are saying, okay, everybody's got to be two meters apart. But then we went to the lunchroom and we had these common tables. Okay, well, let's put uh, the chairs on the corners of these tables, but then tape chairs get moved. And then what happens on busy shifts when a whole bunch of people have the same break at 12.30 or at 5.30 and so people said something, they took a look at it, and now they've actually created a second completely different uh, lunchroom created by appliance displays of all things and set up a snack table and set up a microwave and now it's, as you can see, individual tables with one chair. We uh, come in after my second day of working there five weeks ago and they put plexiglass between the cashier and the member. But after a few days, we now realize another problem because where the keypad is, there's no plexiglass. Or where the person team member who's loading up the belt, no plexiglass. And again, not that members, customers are looking to be difficult, just people drift. You know this as you try to maintain two meters. You may be done it yourself. You chat, you talk, you next thing you know, whoa, 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 I'm getting too close. And we were just finding that some members were leaning in too much or they brought two or three people and it was getting crowded. So, you know, 
suggestions were made, and now only one person can be in that box, and then everybody else has to be beyond the yellow line. And then additional plexiglass. Now both the person unloading the cart and loading the cart feels more safe and is safer because they're behind plexiglass. You know, when you ask questions, you build up that teamwork, camaraderie, and knowledge of people that then becomes friendships. There was a point about three weeks ago, I was outside Costco, one of the couple shifts I'd done outside. And I'm with uh, one veteran of Costco who's been an optometrist since 1991. But of course, the uh, opt optical center has been closed through all of this, and they're only dealing with uh, emergencies. I'm dealing with another veteran of Costco who does outside sales and uh, visits workplaces, selling memberships. And finally, a new hire who had a completely different career, just like me. In this case, he was working for a major international children's charity and doing all the travel bookings, both for the speakers, raising funds and awareness, uh, travel for their mission teams overseas, travel for the executive staff. And then that company let go 97% of its staff on March 13th, the same time I saw all my bookings evaporate. So there's this, this moment where we're getting to know each other while working, where a former motivational speaker, or at least speaker in transition, an optometrist, a salesperson, and a booking agent for a children's charity are all working together to do something that nobody ever thought was needed five weeks ago. We're all wiping down the handles of carts. And as we reflected on this moment, we realized the collaboration and teamwork that we were enacting, massively changing what we expected from a day of work for all four of us when we were in such new roles. But you know what? While it seems like basic work, it's keeping people safe. It's showing that we're willing to be a part of a team and together we're gonna to get through this. The power of interest, getting to know people's stories. I was able to reflect with them at that moment because I knew each of their stories through a little chit chat and conversation. And now I can converse with these wonderful people that become not just employees and coworkers, but friends. The value of encouragement through kindness, compliments, and genuine follow-up. Genuine follow-up, that is, I remember our conversation from a day or two earlier, how can I follow up and see if, whether it's personal or workplace related. Give me an example, uh, workplace related. So there we are at Costco and limiting the number of people that were in the store, but with managers and supervisors and coworkers wanting to say, okay, well, how's it going with that? One additional problem that came up was our two massive coolers, one that holds produce and one that holds our dairy and eggs. So we've limited the number of people in the store, but then these confined spaces, people weren't doing the physical distancing because it was a confined space. So a new challenge, so a new solution. We now have two full-time people, at the, one at each entrance to each of the doors, and they limit the number of people in those coolers to six. One of my favorite questions I love to connect with people in on is, where'd you, where are you from? Where'd you go to high school? Because I've been to, you know, well over 1,200, 1,300 high schools and schools all over Canada. Uh, let alone my work in the States. And I connected with Tasha on that. She was from Nova Scotia, and I uh, knew her town, though I had not been to her school, but could connect with her because I'm a, a, an Acadian Thibodeau. My ancestors are from Acadia, which is a, a name for the Annapolis Valley area of Nova Scotia. My great times 11 grandfather, Pierre Thibodeau, 
arrived in Acadia in 1651, so we bonded over Nova Scotia. So on the Monday after that horrific weekend in Nova Scotia, I right away went out to Tasha. Tasha, my heart is really aching for your home, your home province. And yeah, she got super serious. Oh, Andrew, yeah, oh, that's, that's affected. You know, my, my, my daughter's fine, but oh, it was real close. I mean, really close to where she lived. Well, people appreciate you remembering something about them and following up on it. Think about Beth, my friend Beth. So there she is making that suggestion about getting into a retail space, and that's fine, she made that suggestion. But even more importantly and powerfully, is about half an hour later, she sends me a text with a link to the job uh, posting board for the website of that company that her daughter works for, Loblaws. And so that additional push really helped my brain along that critical day or two as I got my head into the space of applying to a retail opportunity, which would end up being the Costco. Remember I told you I sat with Innes and Doug, the owners of the Norwood Bed and Breakfast there in Cambridge Narrows on that Thursday night as the negative news came in. Friday morning I went down for breakfast and I made the comment that after breakfast I would interact them the money Two of them look at each other and say, Andrew, we've been talking, and tonight, last night, was free of charge. And I teared up in front of them. I said, oh, that's real nice. In fact, she said, I've made you some of my uh, famous cookies. And she had made me like 10 of them. <laughs> and I gotta admit, I ate about eight of them before I got on the plane. I did bring two home to the kids. We had bonded the fact that they love folk music. And so I left them a nice note on the bed. I carried appreciation notes. And I mailed them a, a double CD set of my in-laws and my wife's uh, Celtic folk band. They created a two CD set from about, uh, my gosh, 28 years ago. And I sent them a copy as a thank you for their, their kindness, their encouragement to recall our conversation the night before and act on it. It was just such a powerful moment. For me as uh, an employee now at Costco, how I combine what I already enjoy doing, meeting new people, building connections, is these little compliments, calling out people on what they're wearing. I have an eye for concert t-shirts, for example, so I've seen uh, Jethro Tull, I've seen Scorpions, I just today saw a uh, Roger Hodgson Super Tramp t-shirt, and I called out the uh, shirt and said the lyric, Dreamer, nothing but a dreamer. Super Tramp, a great band from the 70s, early 80s. I. Um, I just love complimenting people. Love your jacket. Uh, uh, love the color of your hair when they add a spice of color to their hair. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, today, a lot of flowers are leaving the store with uh, Mother's Day coming up. And so two young guys, early 20s, both had flowers. I said, oh, guys, are the flowers for the girlfriend? No, no, man, for the mother. I said, our mothers. I said, oh, even better. Tell your girlfriends they're for the mom. That'll impress them even more with your kindness. Give them, and I am giving them two big smiles as they left the store. And you know, giving smiles is sometimes difficult because it's behind masks, both my own mask and their wearing masks. But you can tell the smiles by the crinkling of their eyes. I have pretty severe laugh lines because of the years of being on stage and doing this. Encouragement, kindness. I read of a new term that came up a couple weeks ago in the London Free Press. Instead of fear mongering, what we're doing as we take care of each other is care mongering. And the biggest way I've seen care mongering happen at Costco is when a member comes up with a loaded book and a cart and says, Can you subtotal? this two or three times or can we split it into three orders because I'm 
buying for mom, buying for parents, buying for a relative, buying for a, a health compromised neighbor or elderly neighbor. And we always have the same answer, of course, of course. And one of the first times I really had to deal with this was in my uh, first or second week and I was the person unloading the cart and they said we have two carts but three orders and when it's complicated we just step back and let them touch and put it on the belt and it took a while it took a long while I if it was 12 minutes I bet it was 15 minutes and that's a long time to be dealing with one member at a time and and uh, some of the other team members had to move people who are in line away to different lines and the couple apologized for taking so long. And that's when I spoke up. I said, please don't apologize. You're taking care of your elderly mom. You're taking care of your disabled neighbor. Uh, what you're doing is, and then I explained, is care mongering. And uh, they seemed to reassure them. And they seemed less rushed. And I said, no, no, go over your list and make sure it's right. And, and uh, sometimes when I do the unloading, holding up, is this this order, is this this order? And um, I think people really appreciate those little kindnesses and smiles and efforts to make their life a little easier during these challenging times. Encouragement through kindness, through compliments, and that all important follow-up. Hey, how'd that birthday go last night? I know this is a weird time to have a birthday, how'd it go? We sell a lot of birthday cakes at Costco. Whenever anyone goes by, I just ask a simple, powerful, fun question. Whose birthday is it? Synergy through collaboration creates miracles. So it was November 20th of 2018 that our family of four, myself, Liz, and my daughters, Tori and Isla, grew to a family of seven when Bainey, Rochelle, and Dedeen Mabondo moved in with us. As I said earlier, we had gone to church with their father for several years, and when he was finally able to get his wife and seven kids from Congo, we, uh, volunteered our home to take in some of the kids until housing was figured out. I find it very difficult to put to words the experience of taking in new Canadians. And we offered ourselves not only because our house had the room and that we were willing to create room, but my wife and my eldest daughter are fluent in French and uh, French is one of the three languages the girls spoke along with uh, Lingala and Swahili from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, specifically in their time living in Goma and their final years in Kinshasa. But also that I'm bluntly comfortable living and hanging out with young people for a living. And uh, their English got good quick because I don't speak French. And I, I find it very difficult to put to words how much fun we had across those 10 months they ended up living with us. Um, and just getting an idea of their uh, personality, uh, here's a picture of us playing out in a snowstorm early on in their time with us. And uh, they yelled at me, Uncle Andrew, take our picture. And I looked and yelled, is that a famous statue in Congo? To which Didine yelled out, oh, it will be. There's just these constant moments where they made me laugh and their sense of joy, despite some of the severe challenges they went through. And their singing. Oh, the first way the family said thank you to our church family was their first Sunday being reunited at our church. They sang a song for us in one of their native languages. A few weeks later, we had a carol sing at our church. Uh, their family sang a song. And our friend Bob sang a um, uh, Christmas nativity version of Leonard Cohen's famous song, Hallelujah. Well, after the sing-along was done, Dedeen and Rochelle went up to Bob and said they loved the song Hallelujah. And it turns out that in Africa, 
They don't know the lyric to Hallelujah. They don't know Leonard Cohen's version, but they do know the chorus and how to sing Hallelujah. And just to give you an idea of the power and beauty of their voices, here's the Dean and Rochelle without a warm up, just jumping up, calling on Bob to sing his song again, but this time they sing Hallelujah with him. Take a listen. Emmanuel, our Savior, hallelujah. with which they sing, let alone the way they conduct themselves on a daily basis. It was really a joy having them in our lives now, and especially when they're living with us. But the more I got to know their story, the more I appreciated their energy and enthusiasm and willingness to learn. To, to give you an example, the Dean had a very difficult final two years while living in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In January of 2018, while she was 16 years old, she was attacked on the streets of Kinshasa by three men. It was a very brief attack, but enough that she was bruised and had her glasses broken. And she doesn't have very good eyesight beyond a meter, meter and a half. And that really impacted her where she spent all of 2018 struggling to see. Earlier in 2017, she was diagnosed with an ovarian cyst and was dealing with severe abdominal pain. Money was an issue. Her dad here in Canada was on Ontario Works due to a work, uh, sorry, um, Ontario Disability and Workman's Comp due to a workplace accident that happened here in Canada. So money was a severe issue for the family and, and they weren't able to pay for the surgery. The Dean shared this story with me via an online uh, website where uh, people share stories of miracles. And so she sent me the link early in our relationship. I was able to convert it to French, from French to English. And what I learned was that there she was with her mom with the diagnosis of ovarian cyst, sitting in a chain waiting room and, and, and crying, crying from the pain, crying from the knowledge that she had a severe medical issue and they had no money to afford it. When an elderly gentleman came up and asked them why they were crying, and the dean and her mom explained, and the man walked away. And Ten minutes later, the nurse came back and said that that man had offered to pay for the surgery. And she had successful ovarian surgery a couple years ago. But throughout my time knowing Dedeen, she has continued to struggle off and on with abdominal pain and, uh, and appetite issues. And that all came to a crisis point in April 5th and 6th of 2020 when she couldn't sleep, she couldn't stop crying. The pain, as she said, was just like knives in her abdomen. Her uh, parents spent the night with her at Beth's house April 5th and the 6th. Yet people were, they were fearful of going to the hospital with the quarantine conditions and the early days still of the COVID-19 crisis, but they felt they had no choice and Dean was rushed to hospital on April 6th. Now, because the family was not able to be there and because Dean was in so much pain and crying so much, they actually sedated her. We actually don't know which of the scans that you, the professionals, uh, performed on her that day at uh, Victoria Hospital here in London, Ontario. And speaking with Shannon McCracken, who helped arrange my presentation today, she said it could be one of two or three that could have happened that night. But either way, professionals like you at Victoria Hospital, London Health Sciences Centre, found the cause of those issues. Scar tissue had built up from that ovarian cyst 
uh, surgery and was blocking the her intestine. So she had emergency intestinal surgery the evening of April 6th. And the surgery was a success. Thank you. Thank you for that miracle. Thank you for the unbelievable improvement in Dedean's health over the past three weeks. Um, bluntly, she shared a picture with me of the scar. Um, it's big, um, about 30 staples, but wow, what a difference. And in fact, to show you the power of that miracle, here's a video of their family just a few days ago, April 24th, so less than three weeks after a day where she was crying so much they had to sedate her, less than three weeks later, she's able to join her family and sing a song that would be shared this past Sunday as part of our online church worship service. We're able to uh, videotape songs from people's homes and then combine it in one larger presentation. Here's a brief portion of the song. It's in French. It's called, I'm going to look it up, Jésus partant son precious, or Blessed be the fountain, and just give you an idea of how much better Dedean is feeling as you hear her join her family in this wonderful song. synergy through collaboration creates miracles. And on behalf of the Thibodeau and Mobondo family, thank you. Thank you for saving my niece Dedean's life. Thank you on behalf of Jules and Odette for saving their daughter's life. I, I just struggle with the words. Miracle workers like you every day coming together to collaborate with the courage to share. The power of interest. The value of encouragement. I cannot fully express how blessed I was today to share with such wonderful miracle workers as yourself. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for letting me be a part of such an inspiring day.